Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing well. I got a foggy screen today. I got to clean that up. It gives me like a retro kind of old school feel. But anyways, hope you're doing well. Uh, welcome to State of Cannabis News Hour. Without any further ado, we'll get it rolling. Boom. Share the audio. Got it. Add the stream. Point set me towards the news. Hi. This is my uh, retro look. I'm tired today, y'all. I'm just, I'm just waking up still. You are now tuned into. <laughs> Do you know it? Try to jump the shark. Don't say that. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour where industry leaders, regulators, and lovers of cannabis gather collectively to move policy forward in an inclusive and sustainable way. Professionals and canna-curious alike can tune in to hear leading cannabis experts share and discuss headlines, critical industry issues, social topics, and more. The State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. Hi, and welcome to the State of Cannabis News Hour, where we bring you all the top stories you need to know and talk about them for four minutes and 20 seconds. Our news is bite-sized and infused with a nice mix of facts, opinions, and a pinch of humor. It's Wednesday, December 22nd, 2021. This is episode 177. I'm Susan Sores, the founder of the State of Cannabis News Hour and Conference, author of the children's book, What's Growing in Grandma's Garden, and Cannabis' favorite grandma, AKA Nanogram. Today we're talking about California offering fee waivers for equity firms, women using pot during pregnancy, MedMen opens a new store, GOP lawmakers file bills to study cannabis, psychedelics, and other drugs. An iconic four-star general's family gets into the business and many other frosty nuggets. So stay tuned to the full 60 minutes of the State of Cannabis News Hour. The following program contains coarse language and nudity. Viewer discretion is advised. Audience, feel free to raise your hands if you want to weigh in on a headline after it's been read, and we'll try to bring you up to the stage. Kicking off the show today is Nicole West. She's an unstoppable force in the cannabis industry, taking a hit for a vague and confusing law. This wise and witty Wonder Woman wears her felony badge with honor. Her opinions aren't always popular, but they're usually right as she works tirelessly to guide the burgeoning cannabis industry. What is your headline today, Nicole? Well, my headline is a bit of positive news and something to uh, think about for all of the states coming online in cannabis, as California is to offer financial support for cannabis equity firms through their fee waivers. My headline comes out of Bali Inside, the Daily News, and it was written by Patrick Hudson. Uh, cannabis entrepreneurs that are impacted by the war on drugs can have their permit or renewal fee waived following the endorsement of crisis guidelines given by the Department of Cannabis Control. These guidelines implement Senate Bill. SB 166, endorsed into law on September 23rd, 2021, which laid out expansive standards for the waivers that were mandated that DCC have a fee waiver program set up by January 1 of 2022. The DCC started handling fee waiver demands on January 1st, 2022, and expects to be rolling out extra guidance for licensees and candidates before very long. $30 million has been saved to support these charge waivers. Here's the equity. Here's what equity operators and local equity program leaders had to say about today's approval of state equity fee waiver regulations. First quote. 
Access to capital is the number one challenge for equity operators, and the approval of these regulations puts much-needed much financial support into the hands of businesses immediately, says Nicole Elliott, the DCC director. While these critical first steps, we recognize that this is there's more work to be done to refine the rules. That's why the DCC will immediately begin engaging directly with the equity operators and stakeholders to begin the development of regulations for this permanent rulemaking package. Equity fee waivers will allow me to create an additional business opportunity for my community, high fee barriers to equitable particip participation, and I'm excited about the opportunity that the state is providing. And that was a quote from Ali Jalman of Sunset Connect Equity Business Owner. Uh, fee waivers for equity vendors are important and tangible expression of California's commitment to ensuring that those previously harmed by the war on drugs can participate in the sale of cannabis today. Waiving the collection of fees is an efficient method of providing meaningful assistance to equity applicants while they navigate expansive processes in starting their business. San Francisco waives fees for equity applicants for this purpose, and we are excited to see the support of the state's initiation to do the same, says the San Francisco Office of Cannabis. I say this is super exciting and definitely something that we need to look towards at all levels um, with equity businesses and not requiring licenses, but that definitely isn't all that needs to happen. I definitely think there's a lot more that needs to happen in that process. Um, a quote from the Oakland Cannabis Office was, City of Oakland's 2017 Cannabis Equity Analysis identified access to capital as a primary barrier to equity applicants entering the regulated marketplace. Um, I genuinely think that the City of Oakland needs to reassess too on their taxes. So when we're saying fees, I hope taxes are part of what they would consider that. Because um, if not, uh, the city of Oakland definitely needs to reconsider what's going on there in regards to their actual utilizing the police to help keep these businesses safe. So this is going to you know, continue as it develops. Pretty much all of the government agencies think that it's a really great idea. A few cannabis businesses are pretty excited about it, too. And I think this is something that everybody should take. Um, you know, heed and do if we can get out of uh, having to pay all of these ridiculous fees as we're starting these businesses. Um, I think that's going to be an insanely helpful part of the process for equity businesses. So um, good, good job, California, January 1, 2022. And I'm Nicole West reporting for the State of Cannabis News. I think that is uh, positive news, uh, Nicole. And I do agree with you. I hope they go a little further with the taxes too. I agree. I think the fees are actually fees that go to the city and for permitting fees and things of that nature, but that doesn't address the taxes. And I think maybe a graduated type of tax structure um, that allows people some time to really get the revenue in to become more profitable and more solid would be awesome. So um, it's a great first step, but I think you yeah, have definitely more. These specific fees were the state fees. So this is from the Department of Cannabis Control on the state level. City by city, a bunch of cities have done it, but this is the state fees. So like, from what I understand, like when we have the conversation of our licensing fees, when we pay based on our revenue on, on certain things, um, I, I think that would be waived based on the, the wording and for these businesses, which I think could be hugely advantageous. Also, does the balloon mean it's a birthday? Does, it, does that mean it's Brandon's birthday? Yeah, it means his anniversary. It, his anniversary one year on Clubhouse. Happy anniversary, Brandon. Oh, happy one year on Clubhouse. Baby. Happy anniversary. Yay. Thanks. Okay, celebrate, Brandon. You know, but Nicole, before we move on, it's kind of interesting. You know, two days ago, we did a story about um, you know, social equity and, and bringing all these other different, you know, communities and groups in, whereas like in California, the social equity is like disproportionately impacted communities and individuals that come from those communities. So it's just funny how the definition of what that looks like is different across the board. I just thought I would throw that out there. Oh, I absolutely agree with you, Roz. And uh, I know we're probably at time on this headline, but um, it's mine. So I'm going to keep talking for quick second. Um, I 100% agree with you, Roz, in the way of the the process that needs to be had in um, the uh, BIPOC community as to that being the absolute first step. I do think that there should be some layering to that, though, because I do think that if you were, say, a transgender 
black woman, that that would be drastically harder than a lot of other, you know, it, being a black man, you know, and adding those layers. And if you were a transgender black woman, that I think you should get like three times the opportunity. Um, but I do think that the first conversation does need to be um, the racist epidemic and the, the war on drugs. Um, but thank you so much for everyone's opinion on that. Um, we are going to go ahead and hop to our dope dad and co-host of this show, co-producer Rico Lamite, founder of Canavision. What do you have for us today? Oh, thank you, Nicole. Mine's coming out of the restaurant uh, dive. Waiter plans to acquire a cannabis dispensary POS company for $90 million. And what's looking to be a rapidly growing trend of mainstream delivery platforms expanding their menu offerings to include America's favorite federally illegal pastime, online and mobile delivery app company Waiter announced that it'll be acquiring cannabis dispensary POS provider Kova for a cool $90 million. Some might remember back in March, Waiter turned quite a few heads in the lane when they announced partnership with Flow Payments, citing aspirations for creating a compliant marketplace, delivery and payment solution for solutions for dispensaries. The Kova acquisition bolsters the company's seriousness about becoming a major contender in the green lane on, alongside their expansion into more markets and verticals, including alcohol. The Canada-based Kova was launched in 2017 as a division of IQ Metrics, a wireless software company with over 20,000 locations. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with them and their team as an API partner uh, when I was back at Baker Technologies. And at the time, we were impressed with Kova um, and them being so much more advanced and intuitive um, with their platform um, than their established peers in cannabis land. Uh, COVID now boasts 2,000 plus dispensary and delivery partners between US and Canada. And the company, accu uh, the article accurately stated with cannabis, waiters getting into an industry with major money making potential, but also a lot of unknowns, particularly in terms of regulations that could stifle growth. However, this doesn't really seem to bother CEO Carl Grimstad with the, slight, um, the absolute slightest. Um, as he stated, transactions on the COVA platform could reach approximately $2.3 billion. He did not say when he expected that number to materialize, but I digress. We shouldn't be surprised to see many more established names in the Canatech sector scooped up and assimilated into mainstream platforms just like this. The macro numbers are solid. ArcView uh, Market Research and BDS Analytics reported recently global licensed dispensary sales uh, are expected to reach $40.6 billion by 2024 with, combined, uh, with a compound annual growth rate of 24%. Also, the U.S. will account for about 73% of that global warming. About 44% current U.S. cannabis consumers prefer delivery. Uh, legalization is all but guaranteed to drive that number even higher. The waiter COVA acquisition provides uh, proofs mainstream players that have been playing uh, that have been paying attention to the chefs are now ready to pay for seats at the green table. The article also references Uber CEO Dara uh, Kashras Shahi. Sorry, I fucked that up. Um, telling CNBC his company's ready to start delivering as soon as federal regulations relax. But what about the profits? Although Waiter has generated profits, they're a rare breed in that lane. Analysts believe diversification into booming emerging markets like cannabis could potentially help food service delivery players uh, with ever elusive profitability, uh, which weirdly hasn't been an issue determining valuations. While some traditional investors may skip out on these companies due to lack of profitability, Amazon changed the game 20 years ago. It's all about growth now. Nobody gives a fuck about profits or fundamentals because new rules, I guess. But let's be real. Not everybody's going to be Amazon. They're a once-in-a-generation unicorn disruptor. And if you can't jump like Jordan, you better be able to hit your damn free throws. Fundamentals matter. And in an overheated growth over everything market like the one we've been stuck in since Obama, uh, decided to bail out the same assholes that drove us into the Great Recession. I'm definitely not the only one smelling smoke right now. Uh, if, any, if any of the last bubbles have taught us anything, it's that there will be blood. Sure, we'll see a few of these deals uh, prove to be great investments generations down the line, but the majority won't fare so well. Winter is here. This is Rico Lamit, the dopest dad on the street, reporting live from Santa Barbara for the State of Cannabis News. I'd love to hear what the rest of y'all think about Kova's big payday. Congrats. But is this gas or is it a pass? 
Rico, I definitely have to say that I 100% agree with the reality that there will be a great fall. I've been saying that the cannabis industry is the closest thing to the fucking loan market that I've seen in the state of California um, in my life. And I was in the can in the uh, loan world and in real estate in 2009. And I watched the fucking economy crash. And I've been saying that this is literally a spitting image of what happened in finance in that world. And add, add add federal illegality on top of that, and you got it's going to be crazy. <laughs> so much blood. Don't forget the erroneous taxes, Rico. That's too. <laughs> All right. Well, right next. I'm on that headline, uh, so we'll go ahead and jump to our next correspondent, Liz Rogan. Liz is a cannabis educator, brand strategist, and a healthcare consultant, and the founder of the Cannabis Business Council of Santa Barbara. What do you have for us today, Liz? Thank you, Nicole. Happy hump day, everyone. Thanks for joining us. My story today comes from the San Ynez Valley News, and it's by Mike Hodgson. The headline reads, Santa Barbara County Retail Cannabis Stores Still a Ways from Opening. So Santa Barbara County has issued six retail licenses, um, but the operators selected for the four of this are still working their way through the permitting and licensing process, and it may not be until next fiscal year before anyone opens. As of this week, two of the six have obtained land use permits, and only one of those is in the North County. It's uh, SB Dank LLC, which plans to do business as the Pharmacy SY, Pharmacy San Ynez, and this is on Madera Drive in San Ynez. The other applicant that's obtained a permit is the Pharmacy IV, and that'll be located up Pardal Road in Goleta. So the San Ynez location was a pharmacy before, um, so there were a lot less improvements. And the one in Isla Vista was a restaurant, so there was a little more alterations. But these two have taken the lead and are the only ones that have been allowed to move forward with um, getting the next step of their licensing process. Um, under the county's cannabis ordinances, only one retail cannabis storefront is allowed in each of the six community plan areas. So operators were selected using a three-phase merit-based competitive process. Um, only the final top rank applicant in each community plan was allowed to move forward in starting the process of obtaining the land use permit and a business license to operate in its chosen locations. There are a few other stores that are uh, following in the pack here. Um, one is Haven XLLC, which will be in Los Alamos. And behind the last is Cookies, which will be is uh, in Orchid. Um, rank lists for the community plan areas were released late March, but a challenge over the scoring of applications for the ORCID area was filled by an applicant before the rank list could be released. Sorry, it was filed by an applicant before the rank list could be released. So the release of the list was put on hold until the challenge was resolved, which did rule in favor of the STEAM scoring the application. So um, East Clark SB, which is Cookies, got the number one spot for ORCID. On December 14th, um, there was a board, the Board of Supervisors received a report from the county and it, it, it let them know that they hope to have one to two retail storefronts in operation before the end of the year, which could put more end of the fiscal year, which could pump more taxes into the county coffers. Um, so this is Liz Rogan from reporting from um, Santa Barbara for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Um, this has been a long, interesting process. Um, you can definitely certain see certain operators rising to the top as um, retail licenses are, are issued, at least locally. So I'd love to hear what anyone has to say. And oh, my God, look at this cannabis at the top picture is horrible. This is not Santa Barbara cannabis, I hope. I think it is that, Santa Barbara cannabis because this shit looks like booth. It's definitely outdoor or greenhouse exotics, which looks like it would probably taste like sandpaper going down your throat. <laughs> That's a feeling, not a taste. How do you really feel? Yeah, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> it tastes like burning. I'm cracking up in Rico, man. <laughs> That's, that is that's the true visualization of I, I right. think Santa yeah, Barbara, if, if like. anybody in our audience who has never been to Santa Barbara is the most beautiful little town in the world. I used to go there all the time for work, and they deserve to have top-notch dispensaries and top-notch um, flowers. So let's get it together. Thank you, Roz. Thanks, everyone. This isn't really too much of an update of a story, but since it came out, um, especially with this horrible picture on top, I decided to be fun for today. It really looks like a jar of black tar heroin.
I was going to say, do we do this story so we could talk shit about the weed? Because that weed definitely does look bad. I don't want you to feel like you, we missed the mark on talking shit about that, but. We did it so that I could get a clip of Jason saying it was boof. And to make fun of that cannabis, for sure. It's, it's a strain called sandpaper. Sandpaper OG. Hard pass. Yeah, it's that. Awesome. It does yeah. look because it's purple. That. Let's run that through that Michigan lab and see what happens. Hey, send it out. You got us, Priscilla? Priscilla's not here. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking stoners. <laughs> Where's the spirit of Priscilla passed? <laughs> Request denied. It's solid boof. <laughs> All right, are we at the end of the road for that story? Yes. Let's go. All right, so he's been rumored to, to have smoked joints at Mar-a-Lago in the same room as Donald Trump while he claimed to catch contact highs because they really are a thing. The cannabis industry's longest continuous running retailer, also known as Gucci Blanco in South Florida. Up next is Jason Beck. What you got for us this morning, my man? Oh, very, very funny, Rico. Good morning. Happy hump day, everybody. And, you know, it's a timely thing towards the end of the year when people kind of look at, at what were the top, uh, top stories over the year. And so the LA Times came out with the 25 most read Los Angeles Times cannabis stories of 2021. So here we go. I don't know if this is in numerical order, if they're starting with 25 or they're starting with number one. So I'm just going to go down the list. The headline, California offers $100 million to rescue its struggling legal marijuana industry. Illegal pot invades California deserts, bringing violence, fear, ecological destruction. In lifestyle, the seven things to look for at the new weed wonderland, not too far from Disneyland. L.A. County District Attorney to dismiss 60,000 past marijuana convictions, even though we know it was only 45,000. A California county cuts off water to Asian pot growers. Is it racism or crime crackdown? The 10 best SoCal pot shops worth seeing in person right now. Growing my first pot plant was easy until it was time to smoke it. Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg taught cannabis creativity and a lot of lost lighters. Shikari Richardson's Olympic ban. Why is marijuana still prohibited? And LA's promise of social equity for marijuana businesses has been painfully slow for entrepreneurs while THC edible options for every diet, including keto, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher, still remain a thing. How, how that high couple used YouTube to turn a love of weed into a serious hustle. And in a column, should cannabis workers get COVID vaccine before teachers? They are in California, and they are essential workforce. This tiny city wants to become the Amsterdam of the far west, and Jay-Z seems to approve. In Huntington Park, City Hall, a arrest and suspicion over pot licenses fuel a firestorm. And with cannabis edibles everywhere, dogs are getting stoned on neighborhood walks, which we all know is 100% fake news. Weed, culture, true crime, Bigfoot lore, Sasquatch has something for everyone. And 21 stoner-approved gifts guaranteed to be a hit with cannabis enthusiasts. And marijuana M&A boom awaits in California and beyond. While she made her, her Valor tracksuit in L.A. staple, now she reveals her second act. An op-ed banning an athlete for, for marijuana is illogical, unjust, and dangerous in regards to Shikari Richardson. And one giant French kiss wrapped in money. Cannabis magnate admits bribing San Luis Obispo's county supervisor. And this is L.A. number to pick up your black market pot pizza. While Alan I Iverson and Al Arrington are ready to take over the cannabis scene in L.A. And last but not least, a highly debated list of the right weed for each L.A. neighborhood. And those are the top 25 headlines from 2021, according to the L.A. Times. And this is Jason Beck reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. Hey, Jason, is the L.A. Times fake news or real news? Well, when it's talking about dogs getting high on dog walks, you know it's fake news. 
Jason, are those just headlines from the LA Times or those the are other publications? Just the LA Times, just headlines from the LA Times. And LA being the cannabis mecca, I felt that it was appropriate to share them all. Uh-huh. Okay. You are fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to say, man, um, I'm a huge fan of Jason Beck and his vocal inflection throughout the entire story. <laughs> Maybe we need to just have uh, Jason uh, announce all of the, uh, the headlines going forward. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. All right. Well, thank you for uh, that. Los the Angeles. good news is you're fired. Hmm. Touche. Uh, thank you for that Los Angeles propaganda. And up next, we have Miss Gretchen Gailey. Gretchen is the founder of Panoptic Strategies and a Washington Insider. What do you have for us today, Gretchen? Well, good afternoon, Nicole. It wouldn't be another day in cannabis if Republicans weren't moving the ball forward, unlike those Dems. Uh, in a marijuana moment, we have a headline, GOP lawmakers file bills to streamline research into marijuana, psychedelics, and other Schedule One drugs. Republican lawmakers in the House and Senate have introduced new legislation that would make it easier for scientists to research Schedule One drugs like marijuana and psilocybin. Companion bills filed by Senator Bill Cassidy and Representative Morgan Griffith largely reflect the plan that was recently released by the White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy with the backing of the DEA. Titled the Halt All Lethal Trafficking of Fentanyl Act, the main intent of the identical companion measures is to curb trafficking of the powerful opioid. While reform advocates have expressed concern about provisions that would permanently place fentanyl analogs in the strictest federal drug category, the legislation also contains provisions to streamline the research process for all Schedule One drugs under the Controlled Substance Act. That strict category currently includes cannabis, as well as psychedelics like LSD, mescaline, and MDMA. The bill would facil facilitate studies in part by aligning the research requirements for Schedule One drugs with those of the less restricted Schedule II. Scientists and lawmakers have consistently pointed out that the existing rules for studying Schedule One controlled substances are excessively burdensome, limiting vital research. Rather than having each scientist involved in a Schedule One drug study obtain DEA registration, the GOP lawmakers and White House want to make it so multiple researchers at a given institution would be allowed to participate under a single registration. They also propose a policy change where a research institute with studies taking place over multiple locations would only require one overall registration instead of needing to have a specific one for each site. Another change would allow certain researchers to move ahead with the conducting their studies after submitting a notification to the Department of Justice instead of waiting for officials to affirmatively sign off on their proposals. The plan would also waive the requirement for additional inspections at research sites in some circumstances and allow researchers to manufacture small amounts of drugs without obtaining separate registrations. The latter component would not allow cultivation of marijuana, however. Griffith said in a press release that the legislation would, quote, recognize the danger of fentanyl-related substances by permanently scheduling them while also allowing research researchers to study their effects. Uh, it is important to include that research component because one of the things we've done in the past is we put things on Schedule 1 and then we've not researched it, the congressman said at a briefing alluding to cannabis. There may be potential out there for the therape therapeutic use of fentanyl analogs, uh, but he said it's got to be done carefully. It's got to be done in a way that we've set it up so that we have the protections there, but we may find something good as part of the research. Uh, I think this is a great move. I mean, one thing that we've seen that uh, both the House and the Senate side are at least semi willing to get behind is research. Um, and if we can open the door and make it a little easier for folks to start um, looking into uh, the effects of Schedule One drugs, and that's a good thing for cannabis um, until we can get it uh, to deschedule or bust. This is Gretchen for State of Cannabis News Hour. I mean, I can push back but, um, um, against your your first statement um, coming out the gate strong against the uh, the Democrats and everything. But you know, the Republicans are bringing the heat. They're bringing the ideas right now, and I don't know, man. Democrats, y'all got to catch up. Wouldn't we call those high ideas, Rico? 
No. Well, we have seen uh, Griffith. He has put out uh, legislation before that has not gone uh, very far. Um, we know that um, Diane Feinstein, she tried pushing research in the NDAA that, act, that ended up getting pulled. Um, hopefully with this being attached to fentanyl, um, which everyone's you know worried about the opioid epidemic, that this will actually maybe get passed um, and can help open the doors and inadvertently make things better for cannabis. I think, uh, you know, if it passes, research is good, but research is also potentially a pathway to rescheduling rather than the deschedule or bust pathway that we all hope we're on. Yes, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking that it would look like, it sounds really good, and I really love when Republicans put legislation together that makes business sense, too, because when we're talking about the licenses, that you could replicate this and do it just makes better business but i'm also a little bit concerned sometimes republicans are really good at outlining legislation for business specifically because they're lining up their own businesses and they're not advocating for everybody i'm not it's yeah. not just a republican issue it's also a democrat issue i am excited to see where this goes and where they actually take it versus where you know we hope or where they promise let's see what they actually do with it. Well, well, I agree with you. I don't think we can ever be against research. I'm sorry if it may make things look bad at one point, but research is the only way that this industry is going to move forward. And the medical side, research has to happen. Brandon, Absolute, last word. Absolutely. It just kind of smells like this might be influenced by the pharmaceutical lobby. Well, and let's also remember that research has been handled by the University of Mississippi for the last 25 or 30 years, and look where it's gotten them, zero. So I don't trust the government to do research on us. Forget it. Well, and I, I would just like to point out that these bills are in line with what the DEA is willing to do and what the White House's uh, drug control policy has put forward. So I think this could get somewhere because everyone seems to be on board with wanting it. Get out I your really crystal balls, balls, everybody. We're at time where we've reached the half hour mark. Let's get out our crystal balls and get a room on that. Uh, we need to relight this room, though. So here we go. You are tuned in to the State of Cannabis News Hour, your daily dose. The thoughts and opinions expressed in the State of Cannabis News Hour are those of the individual speakers, not those of any other speaker in State of Cannabis or its members. The statements made in the State of Cannabis News Hour do not constitute legal or accounting advice, and State of Cannabis and its speakers make no representation regarding the legal status of any substance in any country, area, or territory, or any other authorities. The views expressed in this room do not establish any fiduciary relationships. The sponsorship of the State of Cannabis News Hour do not imply or constitute any endorsement by the State of Cannabis or the expressions of any of the opinions whatsoever on the part of the State of Cannabis or any of its speakers. Viewer discretion advised. Let's keep smoking the news. A true Texan born and raised, this young Republican millennial and a representative of RAMP, Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition, promises to be the generational change needed to move things ideally away from the old guard more familiar to Jason Beck and Gretchen Gailey. What kind of spicy Delta <laughs> 8 heat you smoking on this morning? Sarah, straight out of Austin, Texas. Good morning. I'm actually joining you guys from Oklahoma this morning. I'm uh, getting to experience my uh, first time on a farm and uh, getting, getting good with that. But I am bringing you some Texas news this morning. Um, so we've got um, from the Austin Chronicle, that's Delta 8, um, fails in court again. So state ban on Delta 8 fails in court yet after yet another favorable Delta 8 ruling. It doesn't look like the popular cannabis products will be removed from the Texas retail shelves anytime soon. On December 10th, the Texas Supreme Court sided with Austin Hemp and CBD retailer Hometown Hero, uploading the legality of this THC isomer for the foreseeable future. For more than a month, Hometown Hero, its founder Lucas Gilkey, and cannabis advocates across the state have been riding a high from repeated victories across the Texas court system. In early November, a Travis County District Court issued an injunction in Hometown Hero's lawsuit against the Texas Department of State Health Services. The agency's attempt to quickly reverse the decision was rebuffed at the third court of appeals and now by SCOTUS of SCOTX, Supreme Court of Texas, <laughs> um, which, which left the injunction in place and set the case back to the appellate court. It could take up to a year for the case to come back on the 3 CA's docket, just in time for the 88th legislature to take a side in the dispute. The brouhaha started in September when DSHS posted a notice on the website for its Texas Consumable Hemp Program, quote unquote, clarifying um, that Delta 8 had in January been added to the state's Schedule 1 list of controlled substances, possession of which is a felony, as retailers have been selling Delta 8 products for more than a year, thinking they were legal. House Bill 1325, the 2019 legislation that legalized hemp production, they successfully argued that DSHS had 
provided insufficient notice for their action. However, the injunction granted by the district judge, Jan Sophia, has impacts beyond the specifics of Hometown Heroes procedural complaint as it applies to all THC isomer products, including Delta 10 and THCO. Kamal Y, owner of Austin based retailer Grassroots Harvest, sells all those products in his stores and describes Delta 10 as similar to Delta 8 and THCO as slightly stronger. Currently, the only cannabidiol regulated in the state law is Delta 9, the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. The 2019 bill defined legal hemp as cannabis products with less than 0.3% concentrations of Delta 9 THC, but says nothing about their isomers. This is the second case in which DSHS has been shot down for trying to regulate cannabis, but on the authority granted by HB 1325, the first involved agency's unilateral attempt to be on smokable hemp products, which was likewise enjoined by District Judge Laura Livingston 2020. White believes that legalization of THC isomers is a step toward what he says is the right direction, legalization of recreational marijuana we're heading in that direction but very slowly white said it. if it were just a matter of safety we'd already be there so a lot about delta eight it's not going anywhere anytime soon and it's to the point where i've got to take a tolerance break from my delta eight this is sarah fox reporting for the state of cannabis news hour i know i probably sound like a motherfucking broken record but if Delta-8 doesn't, if all of the psychotropic, heavily psychotropic cannabinoids that exist in the cannabis plant don't get regulated, it will be abused. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I know everyone wants to believe that people are going to do the right thing, but they're just not. And if we give people the opportunity to sell things that give somebody a head change um, you will see this be abused if you're not having it be regulated in some form. Um, and, and I'm, I'm all for the free market being able to ever and grow their own fucking weed, um, for your, you know, in a smaller setting, but in the, the reality of just letting people sell this, um, you know, without regulation is fucking unnerving for me. One, because I struggle every day to, to be a part of the cannabis industry. And this is completely counter counterintuitive all the shit that we've been told and, and the things that we've been forced to do and the hoops that we've been forced to jump to jump through and it's also something that i concerned and like legit what about children yeah 100 oh, percent, Nicole. and more importantly when if something goes wrong with any of these isomers which by the way are exactly that isomers not plant-based medicine not what we've been advocating for for generations these things are new and unregulated and when something goes wrong with let's say the children we as an industry are going to pay. This is definitely, yes. the, these unregulated cannabinoids are the biggest threat to our industry. And we have these carpet baggers out here selling it. They didn't pay the price to be doing that. They're just glomming off of us and we need to push back on it. That's exactly. not entirely <clears throat> true, Guy. Hold on, guys. That's not entirely true. 100%, I'm with you, Nicole. 100% it needs to be regulated to the extent that it protects the consumer. But I'm very concerned about over-regulation of cannabinoids because they're going to try to take each single one of them away from us. And I will say, having worked at a retail store that does sell Delta 8, while it is true there are carpet baggers, there are definitely people who are processing and manufacturing an alternative Majority of them are, are not, Sean. I'm sorry. But there, but there are, are though. But it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry. I'm allowed. Not, I'm so, sorry. I'm in Texas, and I work with the retailers, and I work with a manufacturer, and I do understand there's a ton of people doing bad things in cannabis with Delta 9, with Delta 8, with HHC, with THCO, whatever. But we can't make these blanket statements that they're all carpet baggers and they haven't done their time. A lot of legacy operators who are only trying to build the infrastructure that they need to build to get to THC once prohibition ends. 99.9% no of them are all carpet baggers. I'm with you, Guy, 100%. I'm with you, Nicole. Uh, Delta 8 is, is public safety issue number one for the cannabis the industry, and something needs to be done about it. It's a fucking issue. Oh, my God. Thank you. It's so not regulated. And in the meantime, we have THC with moldy weed. I just feel like retailers who sell Delta 9 are threatened by Delta 8. I'll be really honest. All needs to be we have issues, too. And I love the classic regulated. weed, and I'm all about high quality. I get what you it all needs to be regulated. And up next, we have Roz McCarthy. Roz is from Minorities for Medical Marijuana founder and CEO. What do you have for us today, Roz? Hey, good morning, everybody. 
So this story comes from you from Health Day. Um, the title of the story, uh, this is by reporter is Amy Norton. Why are more women using pot in other cannabis products during um, pregnancy? A growing number of pregnant women are using marijuana or other cannabis products, and a new study suggests that relief of symptoms such as morning sickness may be a, may be a primary reason. In recent years, studies have documented a rise in cannabis use during pregnancy. One U.S. government study found that between 2002 and 2017, the number of pregnant women who said they used marijuana in the past month doubled from about 3.5% to 7%. But the reasons they choose to use marijuana have not been clear. So for the new study, researchers did in-depth interviews with 52 pregnant or breastfeeding individuals who had used various cannabis products before pregnancy, not only smoked marijuana, but also products like edibles. Of that group, 30 continue, continued to use cannabis after becoming pregnant, and nearly all said it was to help manage symptoms, most often morning sickness. That's an important point for obstetricians and other health care providers to know, said lead researcher Meredith Van Stone of McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I do worry that providers often think that these people who just don't care that they're using cannabis for fun and could stop if they wanted to, Van Stone said. This is not what we found. In general, the study participants were well informed on the evidence or lack of it and made a deliberate choice on whether to continue using cannabis during pregnancy. This is not to say that cannabis is a good option for managing morning sickness. In fact, medical groups such as the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists advise against using cannabis for any reason during pregnancy or breastfeeding. Much of that has to do with unknowns, the group says. Some studies have linked mother's marijuana use during pregnancy to low um, to um, risk of preterm birth, low birth weight, and learning and attention problems in their children. Those studies do not prove marijuana is to blame, in part because it is very difficult to separate any effects of marijuana from cigarette smoking and drinking, which commonly go together. <sighs> Breathing hard. And much less is known about one other cannabis products. Now that marijuana is legal in many U.S. states, there is renewed interest in the potential effects of prenatal use, said Chambers, who's also the program director of Mother to Baby California. Mother to Baby is a nonprofit that offers science-based information on the safety of medications. When it comes to breastfeeding, there's little research on whether mom's cannabis, um, whether our mom's cannabis use can affect the baby. But Chambers noted it's known that THC, the ingredient responsible for marijuana's high, can cross into breast milk. Um, I'm just going to stop this this because it goes on and on again. And first, I just want to talk about the dichotomy where you start off the article talking about this is something that helped women with uh, managing morning sickness, which is a real, real thing. And then it goes to, well, we associate the use of marijuana with drinking and, and smoking cigarettes. So that's issue number one with this article. But the reason why I brought this article up is because we actually had a member of M4MM who called me about, she just had a baby in November. And literally, she was utilizing cannabis during her pregnancy. And while after giving birth, she was tested and her the baby had THC in, in her system and she had THC in her system. And she was crying because she was like, Roz, this is how I manage my, my morning sickness. She's like, the nurse made me feel like shit, like I was doing something wrong. She goes, you know, they reported me to DCF and she is a black female. And my concern is, is that if you are especially if someone of minority descent that's utilizing this to be able to get through is the greater good better than the possible harm. I'm Roz McCarthy signing off on the State of Cannabis News Hour. I would love to hear your, your comments or thoughts. Hey, hey, Roz, thanks for that article. You know, I, I think one thing that should also be pointed out is when women do have issues during pregnancy, like my wife did, whether it's during pregnancy or postpartum, some of the things that are offered have huge side effects and are not proven to be good for baby. I will always stick with plant-based medicine. I have a 25-year-old graduate student that's been a straight-A student, a 13-year-old that's a straight-A student. My wife obviously used cannabis tinctures to manage her morning sickness, manage depression afterwards. Cannabis medicine is a real thing. And like, we can't, we have to talk about the alternatives as well. The alternatives are not pie in the sky. So let's just have that fair conversation that we've all been waiting to have. I agree, Guy. And, and the fact that a nurse or doctor comes in and looks down on a woman who has made a choice and the type of comments that they made to um, this young lady, um, it was just horrible. Um, and so I think we need to also have conversation about this. And also the, the hospitals are required to report 
based on if there's cocaine, fentanyl, other different drugs. Well, if that is a part of their requirement, then cannabis should be taken off the off off of that list. Especially if you if she lives in Las Vegas. If you live in an adult use medical program, adult use program, then that should be taken off in regards to reporting it to DCF. So um, I think we need to talk about this more. But I, I appreciate your feedback, E. We are um, at time, but we have uh, Lisa and Dr. Felicia up. Uh, Lisa, if you could, uh, 20 seconds on your comment. Yeah, I would like to see articles like this include the fact that there are cannabinoids in breast milk, the naturally occurring ones. And I had C-sections. They gave me tons of opioids. You know, I would have much rather had cannabis than giving me opioids for that because I believe it's much safer. Thank you. I'll be very brief because I'm not in a quiet place, but the decision by ACOG to discourage the use of cannabis is not based on a lack of research, it's based on bad research. And we're at the end of time for that story. This is definitely something that we need to be getting a room for, a spinoff room for, or even a what could go wrong room for in the future. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, something that's definitely going to be causing debate up and down, up and down every aisle going forward. So up next, our, our next correspondent, we call him Clark Kent, and he's a communication strategist and publisher of the American Cannabis Report, Christopher Smith. What you got for us this morning, my man? Good morning, Rico. Thanks for the great introduction, and good morning, Nicole and Susan. Um, slim pickings a little bit on cannabis news today, but I did manage to find a little bambino about baseball in Boston. My story today is reported in a few sources, but the leadoff hitter is Javier Haas batting for Forbes. MedMen opens first store since management shakeup in Boston's Fenway Park. So Medwen Dispensary has played like Casey at the bat recently after building a reputation as the Sultans of SWAT. They've struck out over and over in the face of increasing competition and their own decreasing reputation. Quote, publicly traded cannabis company Medmen has had a turbulent year, having had to deal with management shakeups and the ousting of its co-founder and co-founders and lawsuits. Although the stock is still up 16 percent year to date, it has fallen considerably. From the dollar twenty-nine per share value it reached in February and is now under twenty cents. So MedMen is on a bit of a streak, and a bright spot in the lineup has been hasn't been producing too many home runs lately. Um, last month, the company announced it's prevailed in a high-profile lawsuit brought by a former CFO James Parker, who alleged wrongful termination, breach of contract, and retaliation. He was seeking twenty million dollars in damages, and the jury ruled in favor of MedMen on all claims, determining MedMen does not owe Parker any damages. Earlier this year, MedMen announced it was selling its big New York City dispensary to Ascend Wellness for sixty-three million dollars. And last week, New York State Cannabis Control Board gave that deal conditional approval. So in other news, um, it seems MedMen's making a trade between New York and Boston. And unlike the Babe Ruth trade, this time Boston is coming out on top. According to Forbes, um, according to information procured exclusively, not really, but MedMen will be opening its newest store in, Fe in Boston's Fenway Park area today with a grand opening party at 4 to 7 p.m. Uh, this is the company's first entry into Massachusetts' booming retail market. And as you know, booming is a good word for it. In the first three years of adult use in uh, Massachusetts, the, the state has uh, seen more than $2 billion in sales. And in case you're wondering, the dispensary is not inside the ballpark, but it's about a block away. Uh, it's 4,725 square feet. Uh, the, Fed, the Fenway Park security website states that use of tobacco products and smoking in any of any kind, including cigarettes, cigars, marijuana, and e-cigarettes or vaping is prohibited in all areas of Fenway Park. Uh, but here, here's an interesting twist as well. I think also a sort of a thumbs up to, Fed, uh, to, to MedMen. They're partnering with Mass Cultivated, and ED at the end is uh, capitalized. Cultivated is the first in the nation jo uh, jails to jobs program for the cannabis industry dedicated to connecting three dots in the prison pipeline, expungement, education, and employment. This, edu this innovative public-private partnership provides fellows with robust cooperative education programs in the cannabis industry, free legal services, workforce preparedness training, and cannabis externships with livable wages and benefits. So MedBen may be coming out of the dark era. Uh, curious what other people in the room think about MedMen and uh, how they're trying to right the ship. 
it sounds to me like MedMen is doing some expedited greenwashing right before federal legalization. Yes, and I would like to say that MedMen has never supported any type of expungement work that we have done or I've that I know people have reached out to them to say, hey, and this was back in their heyday, so maybe they're trying to clean it up and get a better image and the whole, I'm going to do this prison, the pipeline. Yeah, look under the hood. That's all. Exactly. I'm with you, Roz. It smells like smoke and mirrors to me. Look, I'm not going to try to defend MedMen, but as a business partner, I have to admit the new team resonated with me. Like if they were sitting here, they talked the talk. I don't know what that means. They are coming from behind the eight ball, as it were. But I have to just give them kudos because my recent conversations with them, at least this new management team, seem to be positive. And that's only California. I can't speak to all the other shenanigans nationally. Yeah. Uh, you know, but and I'm, I'm glad you're saying something, Guy, that you're having good experiences. But when you've had such a mess, you really have to put yourself out there. And that means to cross bridges and and to and uh, and to to extend olive branches, to be like, hey, here's where our priorities now. We want to listen to you. What do you need? And that's kind of what I feel is lacking, but that's just me. Well, and, 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 real, real quick there, and we can't forget how many people who have not been forgiven and given those second, third, and fourth chances like Mad Men have along the way either. How the fuck they weren't canceled is beyond me. Uh, and up next, we have Mr. Guy Record. He is the co-founder and president of Papa Barkley. What do you have for us today, Guy? Thanks, Nicole. Good morning, Susan. Good morning, Rico. Um, this morning, I have an article coming out of Rotors, Routers. I'm sorry. Canada's weed lead is running out of puff. Um, this article basically goes over what we know. You know, Canada often has little choice to bend to heftier market forces of the neighbors to the south, that being us. And in 2018, when they legalized weed, Canadian companies did have a lead and they've been angling and have been getting stakes in U.S. markets, to be clear. And many of these Canadian companies do have some, you know, tendrils, especially into our MSOs. But there are about two billion cannabis sales in Canada 2020, according to a Bernstein analysis that pales. Uh, besides our 17.5 billion in legal sales in cannabis, where cannabis still remains federally illegal. And this uh, survey, Bernstein, expects that the American market will be worth 40 billion by the year 2026. So it goes into, you know, an introduction of Republicans uh, initiatives to decriminalize marijuana um, and, you know, other MSOs like Green Thumb and Cresco that have been trying to push that all of which have, of course, some Canadian investment. Um, their value, and you know, at a time where, where, where things are running out, valuations multiples relative to the revenue are still higher for Canadian operators. That's primarily because they're publicly traded. So oftentimes Canadian companies and Canadian MSOs are given a little bit more uh, uh, valuation based on their projections, even though that still hasn't panned out. The, the suge th that suggests that even the Fed's if the feds don't make cannabis fully legal, the difference won't won't make a difference. You know, the difference won't last. Canadian purveyors with merge uh, Canadian purveyors with the merger munchies need to find their target before then. One structure that is being used as a kind of option to federal action, Canopy Growth boss David Klein, for instance, shelled out nearly three hundred million in October for the right to acquire Colorado edible maker Wana Brands waiting to that deal doesn't go through until federal legalization so canadians have positioned themselves in an interesting way in our marketplace due to the fact that they can be publicly traded and they have helped a lot of non-plant touching companies as well support industries to be uh, on the canadian exchange but i think what this article is, is referencing is that canadian sales at a nation of 40 million that doesn't have even value added products it's mostly flour is starting to falter. While they have national legalization in a continuous environment in their nation, our sales are continuing to outstrip that. And I think what this article highlights is we need national movement now. I think that uh, lots of the correspondents say it, I'll say it, deschedule or bust, let's get this party started and really capture this revenue and start having these things traded on our public exchanges so that we can get the max benefit. I'm Guy Roquart reporting for the State of Cannabis News Hour. We got no Canadians in the house today. America's hat. 
Where's Ollie Muffins when you need him? This is kind of an interesting trend. I mean, interesting that we're seeing this. I wonder if this is some kind of trend we'll see. As I know we had Jason's story yesterday with Colorado stopping growing cannabis and stuff. So are these real red flags to pay attention to? Or is um, is this kind of the ever-changing market that we're dealing with right now? What do you well, guys look, think? Well, look, I can tell you guys well, from experience with Canaccord. I, you know, I, I did a little bit of this Canadian dog and pony show. And Canadians, especially in the banking community, have it in their mind that the same way they control international mining, that they would be the funding source for cannabis, not only in Canada, but internationally, right? So if you look at, at closely at many MSOs, they all have ties to other Canadian large LPs, right? That is the play. Many of the Canadians, because their marketplace wasn't growing, they they basically had this, like you think about Aurora, they had a growth through acquisition model where they were just merging and buying with companies to bring their valuation up because the revenue in their nation was not where it should be. We won't even get into the unsustainability of 100 million square foot indoor grows, but that, I think that's what's happening. And that's what we should watch out for because if we're not careful, all the financing and financial upside from cannabis in our nation might be going through Canada. We are at the end of the line for that story. So um, up next, we have Long Beach-based cannabis and intellectual property attorney, also the head honcho of the deliciously vegan fruit slabs. And you can probably find them posted up randomly on IG where like, where's Waldo with a beard next to your favorite celebrities and influencers? Brandon Dorsky, what you got for us this morning, my man? Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I have an IP-flavored story today coming out of California. Pot seed entrepreneurs say they were cut out of company. It's another tale of a handshake bro deal gone wrong. We're talking about California cannabis company, Next Green Wave Holdings, and its CEO are under fire in state court by their alleged former partners who claim they were cut out of a seed and IP deal without their consent and knowledge. The suit was filed on Friday in Fresno County, claiming CEO Michael Jennings started NGW and schemed to siphon the value of Loud Seeds, a cannabis brand and seed bank, while cutting out his homies. This is of critical importance right now because Planet 13 just announced a deal to acquire NGW for approximately 91 million Canadian dollars. That's 70.4 million US. Planet 13 would be acquiring all of NGW's issued and outstanding common shares through the deal with an expected close in first quarter of 2022. NGW is the company that was started by Michael Jennings without his co-partner's knowledge. We're talking about Kenneth Koskimiemi and Mikalu Almeida, who are seeking 38 million in damages plus reimbursement of expenses and a constructive trust over Loud Seed's intellectual property. Uh, their complaint alleges that they and Michael Jennings owned Loud Seed's business equally and shared the profits, losses, and management. But once the reputation began to get loud, Jennings created a separate company to pitch inv investors and leverage all the value of the IP. Their verified complaint, which is important, uh, Breach, claims breach of fiduciary duty, unjust enrichment, fraud, misappropriation of trade secrets, and several other claims. And a third party company involved apparently entered into an agreement with NGW to have the quote, sole, exclusive, and irrevocable right and option to purchase 100% right, title, and interest in and to the Loud Seeds brand, including its intellectual property, even though NGW did not have the authority to do that. Um, Things that also happened included fraudulent transfer, alleged fraudulent transfers on the Canadian Sur Securities Exchange, where Jennings sold shares of the new company on the basis that it owned 100% of Loud Seeds. Um, more or less, Jennings created another business and fronted like the inventory and the IP of Loud Seeds were his and his alone, which his buddies are claiming that is not the case. And plaintiffs assert that Jennings has profited the most from this charade as he now owns at least 35 million shares of NGW worth a purported 10 million plus. This is, so I don't really know what to say about this. I did not read the full complaint, but it sounds pretty juicy. Sounds like some guys desperately need an intellectual property attorney. And I'm going to be paying attention to this one closely. This is Brandon Dorsky reporting for the State of Cannabis News. Sounds like another day in cannabis. 
So true. So true. And thank you for that headline, Brandon, and helping us keep up with the saga that is the IP that is going to continue to eat this industry up. Uh, and up next, we have Miss Sean Salvaje. Sean is a retired combat journalist and mindset coach working at the intersection of cannabis education and human performance optimization. What do you have for us today, Sean? Morning, Nicole, Rico, and Susan. The article I have for you guys today is actually pretty sweet. Um, General George Patton's family has entered the cannabis industry in Southbridge. Uh, descendants of General George Patton gathered around the kitchen table in August of 2017 to discuss the future of the family's organic farm located in Hamilton, and they have landed on cannabis. Now, mind you, there's no one from the famed General Patton's uh, military heritage that's going to be running this but it is his children. Um, and I think it's great. The whole article is about um, kind of the mindset behind running an organic farm, wanting to feed people, wanting to help veterans and wanting to do something sustainable and family oriented. And the thought process that leads you into venturing into the cannabis market, especially if you're not already um, an experienced consumer or cultivator. So the article is, uh, it's really cute. It's sweet. I think it's a great thing. I don't mind seeing General Patton involved in cannabis when it's his family. All I mind is seeing Uncle Sam sticking his nose in too many things. But uh, I'm going to keep it short because we only have a minute left. And I want to give you guys time to say your goodbyes. Thank you so much. Uh, excited to see what General Patton puts out. And also very happy to say that they were approached by many MSOs and they did not want to sell out the name. So Lots of good recognition for that. I hope that they, they have lots of success and, and many fruitful harvests at the farm. Let's go, General Patton. This is Sean with the State of Cannabis. Thank you so much, Sean. I love that story. Um, uh, we are at the top of the hour and the end of the show. So thank you so much, correspondents, for digging through the headlines and bringing us what we need to know every weekday. And thank you, Rico and Nicole, for co-producing the show with me. Thank you, audience, for making the State of Cannabis News Hour the stickiest show here on Clubhouse. Let's see here. Oh my gosh, I think I've got my light because I'm doing this to you. I am glowing. <laughs> uh, how's it going, everybody? It'll be an interesting day today. We may or may not have, uh, as the cannabis nerd, as it's like three days to Christmas and I got so much stuff to do for the family. Um, but. I will have a video drop probably later today, taking a new concept on the garden journeys. Um, a little bit longer of an episode because y'all seem to want more whenever I play one. So we're going to do a little bit more of like an aesthetic music thing. So it should be a little bit of fun. Um, LC, it's always good to see y'all. It's always good to see everybody first thing in the morning. I hope you enjoyed the news. Um, yeah, should be a fun day. Looking forward to it. See y'all growing. And in the bra.